I got involved with Site 41 in uh, 1985. So for me, there's a bit of, of history. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and tell you the story from when it started till it kind of come close to an end and tell you some of the high points and turning points um, that I witnessed and was involved in. I hope that I'm, I can do a good job for you and uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just get at it. So the Site 41 story started back in the 60s when they uh, licensed a, a landfill site in Perkinsfield, Ontario called the Posey Site. And it was there a private dump to take uh, residential garbage. Within three or four years, the communities of North Simcoe, Penetang, and Midland, and Tiny uh, started to, uh, actually were allowed to by the MOE, to dump industrial waste. And that included uh, toxic waste uh, from all the industries. Some really bad stuff. Um, the site was not engineered, no regulations, it just went at it. Uh, but after a little while, there was concern, and the MOE came in and started to monitor, and uh, people's wells were quite nicely contaminated. And so there was a rush on to find another landfill site. So in uh, 1979, it was called the uh, MPT, the Midland Penetang, tiny group of people started to look for new landfills. So this 41 started in 1979. And so over the next five years, uh, they kind of went around and picked and poked and looked for sites. Um, and after five years, basically, they came up with around 41 sites. And uh, in 1985, the Ministry of the Environment had an in-camera meeting with the northern group of communities and uh, said, look, you guys aren't doing your job and there's going to be troubles. We would accept a site at the bottom end of Tiny in the clay. It would make for a really good regional dump because Aurelia, and Aurelia the city of Aurelia, and Barrie both were having problems with their landfill. So it was a good central spot to have a landfill site. Of course, the purpose of this site was strictly for supposedly the northern communities, but obviously there was something else going on. Um, so as soon as they had that meeting, right after that, the municipalities uh, approached Wayne Johnson, Site 41, said, we want to buy your farm. And he said, no. They immediately uh, went ahead with expropriation proceedings, and he got boxed in. And he was a single guy. He didn't know what to do, didn't have a lawyer, boom. He, he accepted an offer, a conditional offer of $15,000 to do testing on his land. I'll jump ahead to 1998 when the C of A was issued for 41. That's when he got paid for the site. So the county of Simcoe, his gov governing people, actually held him hostage for all those years. Now I'm going to go back to 1985. We've got the site picked, the preferred site. There's not any testing ever been done except in the ditches in the country. So, but it's the preferred site. Over the next four years, they prepared an environmental assessment to go to the joint board. And this would be the second in history uh, that ha actually happened. The first environmental assessment uh, was for uh, uh, Milton, uh, where they had a, a landfill site, and they still have it today. So the joint board uh, started up in 89 with all this evidence. A tiny township was against building this site. Uh, there was a group called the YY Citizens Group, which I was part of. There was eight of us and our wives or, or spouses that organized to fight this. And we called it the YY Citizens Group. And we organized and got funding and got lawyers and had spaghetti suppers and did all the things you need to do to raise money because we didn't have any money. And we had high-end lawyers and we finally, we went to the hearings. And uh, the hearings took place over the summer. And there was 68 days of hearings, in, in which time a lot of evidence was heard. And the lawyer for the uh, proponent, Simcoe, actually was called North Simcoe Waste Management Association at that time, the county was not involved, um, stood up and said, there will be very little evidence on the hydrogeology because it's so simple. So we won't be wasting a lot of time on that. Well, that turned out to be absolutely false. At the end of the hearings, um, there was a decision made uh, by the joint board. And the joint board, it, uh, it turned it down. It says, I do not ex they do not accept any of the evidence. They turned it uh, completely down. And so 
what's interesting about this is they found a lot of things wrong. They called the process a fiasco. Untraceable. It should go back to a brand new hearing. This is over. Um, at the time, the Ministry of the Environment supported all of the evidence of the proponent. So they sat together just like these two gentlemen are sitting together. They were on the, that side. They were fighting us. The MOE supported all of the evidence, which we found out wasn't very good evidence at all. So we kind of started to celebrate a little bit, not too much, because uh, this looks like we'd won. We were going to save, save the, uh, the land and the water. Shortly after, the uh, North Simcoe Waste Management Association uh, appealed the decision to cabinet. The cabinet came back with an order in council. This is something that governments do to the daily running of the government to make sure things are right. And they replaced the order, or sorry, the decision of the joint board, and said, we want you to go back and just go over the whole area again and see if you can find a better spot, anything better than Site 41. If you find a spot, come on back and we'll start a new environmental assessment. If you find other spots and 41 is still preferred, we will continue, we will continue the environmental assessment that stop, we'll say stopped on, on the 68th day of the hearings. So from that time till 93, they, the uh, North Simcoe Waste Management, went ahead. Things have changed now. 1990, the county took over the management of all the waste management of the county of Simcoe. So they were kind of steering this. Yet they had to keep North Simcoe in place because they were named as the proponent. So it was kind of a funny arrangement that the county was behind, pushing, pushing. And so they went all around the, the six northern communities, which became four northern communities because of amalgamation, and they tried to find other spots. And during that time, it didn't look like they were really being serious. And I did some work on my own and found a site that was called 107 that had all this great clay. It was so great, it was incredible. And there was a scrapyard there that was like a dump. I says, well, why don't we consider this as an alternative? It's not agricultural land. There's no airport over top of it. Why don't we consider it just as a comparison? And uh, I think I've caught them four times making serious errors. They took a well from a mile away and put it in the middle of the testing and it was pure sand, yet it was all clay. We all knew it was clay. Because it was sand, it means it was eliminated. Well, I went to, at that time, the water well records were in Toronto, on down Don Valley or something, in boxes. And I went through all the boxes and found the well records and proved that they had made a mistake. And they just said, well, you know, we're doing a lot of work. You know, you can expect this from a consultant. You know, we can make these errors. I go, it's clay. Why would there be sand in the middle? And it went on and on. Eventually. Um, you know, we fought really hard uh, to get more comparisons. Uh, we, we didn't get a lot of support. However, we did highlight the fact that it seemed like the ministry was really on the side of the proponent. So uh, we went back to the hearings and we heard all this evidence. During this, this time, most of the evidence that had been heard was either discounted or, or upheld, except for the hydrogeology. And so there was a lot of evidence on, on hydrogeology, tons of it, back and forth, experts back and forth. Um, at the end of it, and that was uh, day 182. So we've got 68 days, now we've jumped ahead and now we're at day 182, it ended. And the ministry stood up and said, we support all of the proponent's evidence. I have all the transcripts, there's 32,175 pages. So I can go back and check this stuff. And then the, the board went away and came back and said, I have no choice. I have to approve this site. Basically, the order in council has negated all or most of my, the reasons I, I turned it down. So it became a decision, a political decision to approve this site. And I'd like to be able to say to you, that's not my opinion. Because in 1980, 19, 2004, a director from the MOE wrote to me and said, Site 41 was approved through an order in council. So that kind of takes away the environmental assessment process in a big way. Um, so we'll go back now to uh, 1995. And so we'd lost 
But we kept fighting and appeals and, and all this kind of stuff. And the township of Tiny had actually been involved fighting this right from uh, 1985 because they had to prepare for the first hearings in the 80s. And I think uh, Peggy said uh, they hired a lawyer in 91. Well, Harry Dom was involved many, many years before that with other lawyers as well and, and many experts. Uh, uh, Dr. David uh, Charlesworth was the hydrogeologist. There was a lot of people involved, Dr. Kerry Rowe, um, giving evidence. So here we are, yeah, as a group, as a citizens group, just that so you all may be part of one day. Um, we kept fighting, you know, everything we could do. And by 1998, we'd exhausted everything we, we could do. And so we, we stopped. Um, we, uh, 1998 was the time. We had to resign ourselves to this shutting it down. Now, we had formed a group in 1987 called the YY Citizens Group, you know, that had run right through this whole thing. So we stopped and we accepted the fact that uh, the science obviously was good enough and we were going to have to put up with a landfill in our community. So time kind of drifted by. There was no fighting going on and the county was working away because the approval for the site in 1998, they issued a provisional certificate of approval. That means they had to have a plan, because at this point, there was no plan. They just approved a principle, that this was the best site and it could work, and the MOE would handle the details, and you, our previous speaker laid them out quite well, how much details there could be. <clears throat> so in, in the year 2000, uh, very early in the year, um, the county got organized, and part of the conditions of the C of A, we heard about the conditions of the C of A, was they had to form a community monitoring committee that would have three members of the community, two members of the township of Tiny, and uh, I guess one member of the county, does that sound right? Yes. And in the, uh, the, the conditions, the joint board, uh, Mr. Bob Eisen said, the voices of the, of the residents shall be strong on this committee. And I often uh, hinged on that many times when I was getting beat up by the county and the MOE. Uh, I said, look, you're supposed to be listening to us. So that was formed, and uh, I think it started meeting, I can't remember, September. And I wasn't, I wasn't on it. I, I didn't get elected. There was a number of people within the community, and it had to be within three kilometers of the site. <clears throat> and so the meeting started, and uh, it was just starting. I mean, they're going to build a dump. In February of, of 2001, a document was obtained by uh, some people in the area, my neighbors, the, the Leonards, because their son, Darrell, was on the committee. And it talked about how the county, well, actually the county administration wanted the elected officials, the two different divisions, to approve the placement of a liner at Site 41 to protect and preserve our water. And how much money it was going to save. And because there's so much water, upward gradients, potential metric pressure in the ground pushing up, there was going to be over 50 million liters of water going into the, into the base of the landfill site. In the hearings, the evidence was 1.7 million liters of upward gradient. And we're like, what the heck is this? So they're going to put a liner in to protect our water. So we wouldn't have to treat it. I mean, we'd have to truck all, you've seen them trucking the leachite away. It's a great picture there. Um, so they would have to truck this 50 million liters of, of leachite away every, every year. Or over the period as, as it developed up. It, not, not at first, but it takes some time to create the leachite as he quite nicely pointed out. So this was a turning point for all of us in the community. Uh, because when the board ruled in 1989, one of the things he said was, pardon me for going back and forth because I, I need to line it up in my head. He said, the residents will never again trust the experts, especially the MOE. So it was like, boom, we can't trust them. Because in the evidence, they said, liners are not proven, liners will leak, and the MOE won't accept it. Yet now, this now we've got the final design coming and we've got a liner. What's going on? 
And then, of course, over the subsequent years, we learned that liners uh, have a warranty, could be 15 or 20 years. However, the welds in the liners is only two years. And you'll see, he, he explained to you quite nicely, well, you can fix it, you can fix it, but only before you put the garbage on. Once you put the garbage on, there's no fixing it, and, they, and they're going to leak. And so we were really concerned, and we continue to be concerned uh, in the remainder of the fight from 2001 on. But that was a turning point. Like, they always say, what, what made this happen? What made that happen? Because I'd given up. I mean, we can't, we can't, we can't do anymore. We've figured out everything legal. So then we, we started again. Of course, the CMC would meet once a month and it, talk about all the issues. And it was very troubling. We weren't getting much cooperation out of the, uh, the county and, and the, the ministry wasn't too bad back at that time. So out they come with the, the design operations report and Peggy took her boxes. Oh, she didn't. And they, so she comes out and we all get these big things right, to check. <laughs> wow. Um, and so they have to be peer reviewed. That's very important. Remember the word peer reviewed. So the peer review started. And so Tiny Township had a peer reviewer, YY Citizens Group had a peer reviewer, and the ministry was a peer reviewer. Tiny Township had hired uh, like a group. It was Dixon and uh, Severance Severin Sound and another outfit to do all these things. And when the peer reviews were done, if you took all of them, there was 300 errors and omissions. But if you took the duplications out, there was 200. So we had a meeting and the MOE gentleman, representative, senior uh, uh, hydrogeologist for the MOE, Ray yeah, Ray Staffis, he says, I asked him, I said, how many mistakes would you normally have in, in this kind of a document? He said 20 to 25. So um, I said, what happens now? It's up to, the, up to the county to go on back and fix it. So back they went. And in 2006, at the end of 2006, they came back with another document. <laughs> Something like this, and all these documents. And uh, they fixed everything. But during this time period, we noticed that there was a modeling issue. They were using modeling. And uh, to verify all of the hands-on stuff. Now, I want you to think about this site. It's 20 hectares, 50 acres. And they drilled wells around the outside on the property lines of this 50 acres, boundary we'll call it, and they drilled one in the middle, or two, right in the middle. And they based all of their, all of their scientific work on these wells on the outside. Never putting one hole in one cell, ever. No, not until much later when they dug the holes. So we have all these monitoring records and all this stuff happening, and we have this modeling. And so I, um, when, when I was on the CMC, I contacted uh, Dr. David Charlesworth. I says, we got some problems here. This stuff's not adding up. You know, we can see there's a problem as citizen science. You know, we, we were learning this stuff. Was I ever learning this stuff? And I spent a lot of time with David, and he taught me how to understand modeling and all this thing. And uh, he said to the CMC in documents, the modeling is fundamentally flawed. Well, how can we fix it? You get me the, mo the calibrated model and the input, and I'll check it. Great. So we went back, and we asked the county for it. Well, it doesn't look like there's going to be a problem. Mr. Jager, who was Jager of Jager Hymns, said, uh, well, um, shouldn't be a problem. I just have to get permission from the person who hired the county. Well, that opened up a, a real big problem. All of a sudden, it became preferential, blah, 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 and we couldn't have it. Well, this is ridiculous. We just want to check. We paid for it. Taxpayers. We all paid for it. They weren't going to give it to us. So then I went through Freedom of Information. And I'll just kind of back up a bit. I've been working on Freedom of Information now for about two years because I was unable to get information out of, out of the county. And so I got kind of into that stuff. So we had a Freedom of Information request now in place for the calibrated mod flow. So I'll stop there and say, OK, now we're, we're trying to get this information because the CMC, which is supposed to have some kind of say, can't get the answers. And we're seeing things that aren't working out. We can just see it. Um, so now I'm going to go back to 2005. Because I was uh, 
kind of concerned that, that maybe the Slate 41 was going to be more than Slate 41. That maybe they were going to uh, build a big factory there called a, a MER for an integrated waste management and uh, take garbage from all over the place as the information I collected. So I, I learned that the county had planned to uh, try and get uh, Gray Bruce's garbage, recyclables, and all of Muskoka's and bring it to an integrated waste management in the county of Simcoe. So I made an FOI. I want all the information. 27 months later, many dollars and lawyers and arguing, I got a package that showed that they'd made it, they'd bought property beside Site 41, and uh, it was the preferred location to build an, it was design, build, Miller Waste, integrated waste management facility that they would operate. Well, as members of the CMC, we had every right to know anything that would affect a dump. Um, so that was a violation. Uh, it's a violation of the C of A, because it says in the C of A, anything to do with Site 41, and it did because the plan was to use the scale house on Site 41. The MOE didn't really um, like my theory on that. Anyways, we didn't get much support, but we did find out that the county had been working uh, inappropriately, and a lot of the documents that I got were stamped confidential, confidential. And the question of the IPC adjudicator was, why and when did they get stamped? Well, we just stamped them, they said, just to clarify things. So when you are trying to get information out of a municipality, they may not be as forthright as you would hope, and uh, you use this FOI system. So now we know that this is going on, and they, they said to me, in writing, of course, because I love writing letters, that, no, no, we stopped considering that in 2003. Well, then I found documents in 2005 where the uh, county had applied for funding for $30 million Miller Waste Design Build Integrated Waste Management. So I got a feeling it was still on the books. And it goes on and on. In the end of 2006, they showed how much money they'd spent. Um, uh, yeah, it was still going on, but that's all still a secret today. And at the same time, they were dealing with the uh, Camp Borden, uh, which is in Angus, uh, trying to make a deal with them to take over their landfill and develop something. And that's still all a secret today. Uh, and I'm, it, whether it's good or bad, I don't know. It's just I think that information should be more free-flowing to the taxpayers that are paying all, all the bills. So now I just got to kind of get myself back on track and we're back in around uh, 2007. We're, we're trying to figure out the uh, calibrated mod flow. Uh, we're trying to find out uh, what's going on. And now I want you to visualize the 50, the 50 uh, acres or the 20 point something hectares and these wells that are all around it and one in the middle. And they did some ciphering, some calculations to show the height of the water all over the site. To, sure, to make sure that there was always an upward gradient. And the upward gradient being this pressure of the water pushing up. Um, so I asked, I, we, so there was a grid, like putting wires all across it, and they're all artificial, and it showed the depth of the, the water. So I asked, how did you figure that out? Well, we just did some stuff. Okay, repetitive something. Uh, Ray, can you say the word, that what they did? Uh, they extrapolated the numbers. Extrapolated, you know, repetition over and over, and they figured out these are the levels. But still, remember, we're relying on borehole five in the middle of the site, and all these ones on the outside. Okay, so there's something wrong. Like, this doesn't make sense, because I got looking at the numbers, and I can tell you, there's a lot of numbers. There's just Peg, Peggy showed you a blue book here, or this thing here. This was the monitoring for when they were doing the testing for the permit to take water. But it's all here. If you go through it, you can find the numbers. It turns out that, that they were measuring the water in the aquifer, the confined aquifer, down in the sand level, what was pushing up. They were, they were also measuring the water in the upper aquitard. That's from the grass down, down to this here till. Really hard stuff. And the water at borehole five, at times, was above the ground in the upper aquitard. Well, there's no pressure in the upper aquitard. It's just water level, like the rain. And so we kept questioning, well, how can the water be above? And then since 2001, we found out that water never, it never went down. It never fell. And they based that borehole five in the middle like a circus tent up here, and all the strings going out, it made it appear the water levels at the site were much higher than they really were. Sorry, Steve. 
Why should it have fallen? You said it never fell. Right, Paul, uh, uh, I'll just be better at that. Um, we have the water that's down inside that's confined. So you have a potential metric pressure caused from the highlands, the highland off to the east, pushing down and it's trapped in there. If you punch a hole in, it sprays out and it comes to a certain head. Then there's the water in the ground like on your lawn. You put your water on it and it goes down, it, it saturates and, and goes away. So at site 41 there's this upper aquitar that has that water. Well, the measuring tape that was in those pipes measured the water at times above the ground. Well, the only way that could happen is if either they weren't really measuring um, the upper aquitar, they had actually were measuring the confined aquifer. And so in order for the dump to work, and the C of A was very clear, you, th there must be upward gradients or the site is shut down. So it appeared there was times the water level was below the bottom of the, of the cells. That's what it appeared. You know, what are we? We're lay people, right? But that's what it appeared. And so the county then said, even if it does that, it'll meet reasonable use guidelines B7. And that's where the proponent is allowed to pollute the water on the land they own by up to 50%. Or if they're going to drink the water on the land, up to 25%. It, it does allow then the water, or the, this contaminated water, to cross onto your lawn, your next door, at 49.99%. It's not a very good rule. And it was really not part of the conditions of the C of A. So even if they say it'll meet reasonable use, which I doubt it would, um, it was a violation of the C of A. It should have been over right there, and we were unable to kind of prove that. So um, this, uh, this information that we're collecting, we're studying it and studying it, and you all have heard uh, on the tape, on the video from the county, that the water moves through the clay at two centimeters a year, upwards. Well, that's just great, and that is probably true in the layer of the lower aquitard that's very dense, uh, that, that's in between the upper aquitard, which is fractured clay, and the lower confined aquifer. The upper aquitard is all fractured clay. So the water moves through it rapidly, very rapidly, up and down, up and down. Um, so I think, well, if it's only coming through at two centimeters a year, What's, where's all this water come? Well, it's just the water in the ground. It's just all there moving around. But in order to maintain upward gradients, that two centimeters has to push against water. And if there's certain types of the air that the water is down below the cells, there's no upward gradients being realized. And what we found out in these documents was, on page 91 or something like that, there's a lateral movement under the site of approximately 700 to 750 meters a year to the east, which goes towards a cold water fishery. Well, the, that means that within a year, that water is already gone. It's off site, so it wouldn't meet reasonable use. So as a CMC, we kept asking all these questions, answer our questions. And to this day, we've never got the answers. In fact is, the CMC was disbanded when the uh, certificate of approval was uh, revo revocated? Revoked. 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 Um, so if this was the superior containment site that the county would have us all believe, why wouldn't you want to show everybody this great evidence? And so I look at the fact sheet that's still being put out. In fact, this is today. Here it is. They're giving us this stuff. And they got, I've never seen this stuff. This is my, this is my first day to see this. And it says, peer review of the mod flow model. The county does not have and never had a right to the control of the mod flow model. It was always owned by Genevar, which bought, purchased uh, Jager Hems. And they'll say, you know, this was reviewed. Well, I can tell you right now that the Ministry of the Environment Dixon, Golder, have never seen the calibrated mod flow. They say, we respect the opinion of the consultant. Well, I don't know if that's good enough for me, because I paid for that, along with you too, and I want to see it. And I had a 
I had a consultant, an engineer, who said, it's flawed. Same association they pay their dues to. Till this day, no way. We haven't got it. So when I see fact sheets coming out like this that are incomplete, it's kind of like a propaganda. Um, and why are they doing that? Why don't we just get to the truth of the matter? So it's a, it's a bit... It's hard for me to come here and speak and listen to speakers before me with stuff like this and listening to what they're saying. It's, uh, it's inappropriate. Um, to me, the County of Simcoe and the ministry should be celebrating um, all of the people that fought the dump because we were able to save that environment. And uh, um, uh, that's just what I believe. Uh, another part uh, that was really interesting in this, because uh, you heard him talk about uh, vermin control and birds and things like that. Site 41 was located 4.6 kilometers at the end of the runway of an airport. And there's a guideline, Transport Canada says 8 kilometers. However, it's not a big enough airport to apply, so Transport Canada, only thing they can do is come down and shut the airport if there's a risk. But they can't control it. So, during the hearings, the county wanted to use pyrotechnics and whatever to get rid of the birds. The MOE said, no way. And so, the board heard evidence that there will be overwiring with falconry as the backup. It's, the, it's very expensive, but it's the safest. And one of the reasons they didn't want pyrotechnics, too. First of all, it's way too loud for the neighbors. Secondly, it drives the birds straight up. This is a a runway. This is the, uh, where the planes come in, so bad idea. During this process, in, in, in between 2000 or 2001 and 2 or whenever it was, I can't quite remember, they changed it and said, oh, it's not going to be a problem and we'll consider overwiring later. So they basically gutted the decision of the board. Now, we tried to go back to the board, but both, both members, the first member, uh, Ms. Ms. McRobb, would not come back to the second stage of the hearings and uh, retired. And Bob Eisen, he passed away. So we were unsuccessful in testing any of this stuff. And my experience has been, um, and there's nothing that's changed in my head, is that the Ministry of the Environment and the proponent work way too close together. And they keep that information very close. And I think that's inappropriate. It's not to say that the Ministry in general isn't trying to do the right things, and they are. Uh, but just like the county has the county politicians and the administration, we have the same in provincial government. We have the political masters, but we really have the administrative masters. And so they're, they're fighting all the time. And we need to improve that. And the way to do that, of course, is to encourage us, to encourage our politicians to stand up, because that's what they need. They need our support. And so we're screaming and yelling at them, it may not work. My uh, claim to fame has been to keep smiling. Um, don't throw the thing we talked about yesterday. You know, throwing mud, you end up on it. It was a good saying. What's that saying, Ray? Throwing mud, you're losing ground. Throwing mud, you're losing ground. So it's a very good saying because it, as soon as you offend somebody, how can you negotiate? How can you come up to some kind of a reasonable compromise? Um, what we've learned in this whole process is that we were never able to properly um, properly negotiate with those that we elected. It just didn't, didn't work. And for, for me, I was involved a long time ago. We came up with a plan in around 1990, 91. It was called the Zero Waste Plan. Um, and it was, uh, it was so we could really reduce the amount of garbage, so we came up with an alternative. Um, and we had the provincial government was on board. We had everything going for us. We were going to be a demonstration community for all of Ontario. Um, there was one catch. The county of Simcoe had to agree because they were the masters of garbage. And they said, if you let us build Site 41, we'll consider it. Well, sorry, we didn't compromise because we didn't want them to build Site 41. And here we are 20 years later, and now I'm on the board of uh, Simcoe, or Zero Waste Simcoe, doing the very same things, and now it's time has arrived because we have to do this kind of stuff. And we're pushing the county, and the county may lay claim to greatness, uh, but I can tell you it's, it's because of the pushings of individual people within the community that are trying so hard to come up with solutions uh, to this problem we have. So now we, I'm just going to check, uh, sometimes I get on a rant and I can't remember where the heck I was. Uh, I'm just going to go through this and make sure I've caught enough of this stuff that might get your attention. Yes? Did you want to 
talk a minute about uh, stopping a politically done deal? Like, what was the process that was undertaken to turn the decision on town council? And uh, we have about 10 minutes before lunchtime, so maybe that's something you want to touch upon. Okay, okay. So how do we stop it? Well, I didn't stop it. I mean, people stopped it. I just kept saying, stand up. People go, what do you mean stand up? Well, I said, try it. Just stand up and see what it feels like. Stand up. Hey, this feels not bad. You know, they won't hurt you. Just stand up. And so more and more people got involved. And we were really fortunate that um, our sales pitch seemed to work. Like we, we got people on board. People started coming on board. And uh, you know, I, I can't quite remember the order or the magnitude of how all this happened. Um, but I can tell you, I was, uh, uh, I was at a meeting at the top of the Toronto uh, Royal Bank and Sheila Rogers was hosting and there was about 25 was in there and Trent University was there and I got to speak a little bit and I got a call before I got home, driving home, my wife called and said, there's a guy named Goldhawk wants to talk to you. I said, yeah, okay, he wants, to, he wants you to come down or wants to be interviewed. And I said, that sounds great. So I... Uh, next Tuesday morning, I drove to Toronto, not realizing there's a phone, right? I could have used my phone to talk to him. But I, uh, I drove down there, I was a little like anxious, to say the least. And down I went and I had, I had a, pile of, uh, a pile of books about this size <laughs> in with me because I thought, what's he going to ask me? So I went into the building and I got to meet, uh, meet the producer and I sat there. And then finally my time come, I was going into a box of black glass and these big things on my ears. And I got up and they said, okay, Steve, it's your time. And I got up, got my box, and I, I put them down. And the guy with me says, what are you doing? I said, I don't need this stuff. <laughs> it's in my head. And so that was the beginning, you know. And we started getting, we started getting some press. Um, and on the November before, uh, a young man uh, named Danny Beaton had said, Steve, I've seen all your signs. Uh, because I was quite busy building signs. And he said, uh, could you, uh, let's go walk to Toronto, get some press. I said, okay, so in November we walked to Toronto. And, and we got a little bit of press. And we, I think what we did is we rallied the people. And the people stood up. And it caused the politicians some aggravation. Um, meetings and, and, and this type of stuff. Uh, it seemed to be that once we were able to get the imagination of people that this was, the purest water ever measured on the earth. What are we doing putting garbage in it? And in fact is, why are we building any more dumps? We don't even need them. We've done all this work and we said, you know what, we, we can get around this if we use our heads. And so at the end of the day, it was basically people pressure, in my opinion anyways, causing the politicians to actually reconsider their positions. Um, and the day before the final vote, or two days before, and I was working so hard trying to get this calibrated model, I called up a very good friend, I will call him, a lawyer, and I says, I want you to make this offer to the county. You tell them if they revoke the C of A, change the zoning back to agriculture, and put a, what was the other one, a covenant in, nothing for waste management on this land. And uh, my friend said, Steve, I don't know if they're going to go for that. That's, they're, they're not going to do that. But I said, do it. So he did it. And uh, the vote came the next Tuesday morning, I think it was Tuesday morning, and they voted to shut it all down. Then I learned my offer had never been seen by the county councillors. They held it back. Anyways, the point is, I was willing to put everything on the line because we needed to stop the dump. Because when we started to fight this many years ago, we had a goal. It was to stop the dump. And uh, as much as I'd like to keep pushing and all that, uh, we stopped the dump. So yesterday, I spoke to the IPC because we're trying to figure this all out and he said, Stephen, regardless of what happens in the future, the precedent that has been set for people holding back information can't go away. Maybe you'll never see the calibrated mod flow. Maybe there is none. We don't know because nobody's seen it. Um, for you and you and you in the future, you'll be able to go say, we want that information and there's a precedent set with the IPC. So that's pretty good stuff. So when you have a thousand people rallying, and you have, you have uh, First Nations people, you have people from all over standing up going, what's the matter? Um, I think what, what flipped it was the political minds. It's like, you know what? We're in big trouble. Even though the administration, this was their goal. This is what they wanted. It's perfect. And I, I think that we really have to improve. Uh, um, Peggy made a really good point. We are part-time people. We don't get paid enough to do it. 
um, but it's our civic responsibility. The County of Simcoe is a half billion dollar corporation being run by 32 part-time people that might show up or might not show up and uh, they stamp a budget for half a billion dollars, maybe looking at it for a couple days. No way that can work. And so they're making decisions that maybe not are uh, appropriate. I'm not suggesting what the answer is. I'm just saying that's how we got here and that, that has to change. That's fund fundamental. Um, I'm really so pleased to be part of a group of people that just stood up. Um, that's what I think caused it, along with keeping records, written records. Don't be spending any time yelling at somebody. Write a letter. Get an answer back. If they don't answer back, hmm, I guess they're not interested. They're not representing you. Records. I have so many records. My wife would just love me to leave them in a house and move because uh, there's too many. However, they were critical in going back to find out what somebody said because um, I couldn't share the story without having kept all those records and, and mold it through my mind. Uh, so this is a great victory for all of us, not just the people of Site 41, because we're going to move now towards a zero waste society and we're going to stop polluting our water because nobody, in my mind, has taken and calculated how much it costs to build a dump. Because there's no value being put on water. To, my, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they haven't figured it out how much it costs when we lose that water and then try and fix it, uh, all that stuff. Uh, you know what? I've said enough. I've stopped. Ask me a question.